there are a lot of layers to the impact and the healing of childhood sexual trauma. But there is one in particular that is really incredibly challenging and it affects so much our view of who we are and our relationships. Welcome, I'm Peggy Oliveira. Thanks so much for joining me. So I talk about this a lot and I know that it can be a really difficult conversation. It can be a difficult thing to face. And the reason that it's difficult is because it exists and that's why we need to talk about it. And that is shame. I know, I know it's not easy. I know for many of you, there's a part of you that are, that right now is wanting to just move away from this conversation. And there is no shame in that. The reason that shame, or at least part of the reason that shame is so impactful is because the experience of shame naturally causes us to want to move away from it. It's not safe to feel that sense of shame because in that sense of shame, there is so much unworthiness and often self-loathing. And unfortunately, many times, it is that intense experience of shame that leads people to feeling that they want to take their life because it is such an intensely deep and powerful feeling. And there is one thing that creates shame that runs incredibly deep for survivors of childhood sexual trauma. And that is something that I think is really important to talk about. And while there is a lot more conversation happening around sexual trauma and childhood trauma and things related to that, I'm really not hearing too many people talk about this. And that is having more than one perpetrator. And that could be that you have two perpetrators in your life. It could be that you have too many perpetrators to count. And that can look a lot of different ways. The circumstances can be quite different. But inevitably, everybody that I have ever known, whether it's been somebody I've worked with or somebody I've known personally, and this was certainly true for myself, having more than one perpetrator was the thing that I was able to hold on to most strongly to reinforce my shame, to reinforce the sense of responsibility that I held on to for what happened to me, for what people did to me. We blame ourselves. I've never known anybody that didn't blame themselves. They may not consciously think about it a lot, but when we really get into it, there's a lot of self-blame and that self-blame can look or sound differently for different people, maybe even at different times. But having one perpetrator, we find ways to make it our fault. And I've talked about how we do that and why we do that before. When we have multiple perpetrators, we look at that, we experience that as irrefutable, absolute evidence that it is in fact our fault. And part of how we are able to continue to believe that so deeply is because we don't hear a lot of people talking about it. And this goes back to something that I say all the time, the importance of having conversations. Because for me, while it didn't resolve anything immediately, my, I believe it was the first night of my support group, and probably the reason that I left there thinking, why are we talking about this? It was in that support group that I learned for the very first time and I was like in my mid-20s at that point. 
but I learned that I wasn't the only one that had more than one perpetrator. That I don't remember how many of us were there. I think maybe five of us. And I believe three of us had more than one perpetrator. And I was shocked. It was a little hard to believe because I had spent my entire life from the time I was seven years old when I had my second perpetrator, believing that it could never happen to other people. And it was proof that there was something just inherently bad about who I was, that I was causing this to happen. There was something about me that drew these people, that made these people believe that it's what I wanted, that it's what my value was. And on that night, hearing other people acknowledge that they had more than one perpetrator, I really kind of was in shock. And the shame took a long time, a lot of healing, more healing that needed to happen in order to be able to fully release that. But it planted the seed. It helped me recognize that it wasn't just me. And if it wasn't just me, if I wasn't blaming these other people for having more than one perpetrator, then was it possible that maybe it really wasn't about me? Again, it took me a long time to get to the place where I fully trusted in that, in that truth, but it planted the seed. So what do I mean by having multiple perpetrators? It really can look a lot of different ways. What I have experienced myself, what I tend to see happen for other people as well, is if you experience childhood sexual abuse, so I would say, particularly under the age of 13, um, that so many people can experience sexual abuse by another person under the age of 13, meaning the person themselves is under the age of 13, not the perpetrator, although that's not unheard of either, but I'm talking about adult perpetrators for this purpose. So it's not at all uncommon for somebody under the age of 13 to have more than one perpetrator during that time. Often, what can happen, whether it's one perpetrator or more under the age of 13, is it's very common then for people in their teen years, as they start dating, going into high school, into college, age range, that many people find themselves in situations where they are sexually assaulted again by maybe it's a boyfriend or even a girlfriend, a, an acquaintance, somebody that you go out on a date with, a lot of different types of scenarios there, maybe a classmate or even a coworker, but somebody that you kind of know, that's a very common scenario that happens during that time frame. So while that is sometimes quite different than under the age of 13, because under the age of 13, it can certainly be a stranger and it can be somebody that you've never known before. Um, and that doesn't diminish it in any way. But oftentimes for people that are sexually abused before the age of 13 and certainly before the age of 10, oftentimes it is somebody that is a part of your life in some capacity. Um, likely have maybe been a part of your life in some capacity for a long time, or they are serving an important role in your life. Once you become 13 to 15 years old and older, you start developing your own relationships, right? So you start um, dating, you start developing your, developing your own friendships and spending time away from your family. And so those types of relationships or some of those kinds of relationships, that's where sexual assault can sometimes happen again. And then into our adult lives, that kind of pattern can continue. So I've known people 
personally that have had quite a few perpetrators um, in those various scenarios. My own personal experience is having two perpetrators before the age of 10. Um, and both of those situations were ongoing. The first was my stepfather, and that went on for about eight years. And then the second person, I was about seven, and that was off and on for, in some capacity, actually, I would I didn't think it had actually been that long, but I'm thinking about it now. And I would say probably about six years, maybe it went off and on. And then I had another perpetrator when I was, I believe was 14 at that time. And interestingly, even after becoming a therapist and being in private practice for a while, so I'd been doing this work for quite some time. There was another experience that was a sexual assault when I was 13, 14 years old that I never identified as a sexual assault. Not until, gosh, at this point, maybe five years ago, maybe a little bit longer than that, I never saw it as a sexual assault, which I find kind of intriguing because I've been doing this work for a long time and I talk all the time about being in denial about the reality of our experiences. Um, and that's one of the things that people can do quite often generally as well, especially when we go into those acquaintance types of situations is not name it or label it as such. And part of the reason that we do that is because we take on the responsibility for it. And in that particular situation, I did take responsibility for it um, in, a, in a variety of ways. I took responsibility for it. And I've also known people more in a professional capacity that have experienced different types of sexual trauma, childhood sexual trauma that can incorporate like I said, far too many perpetrators to count. And that tends to happen often in like sex trafficking. And that sex trafficking could be kind of what we tend to see and hear about, which is like being kidnapped and put into the sex trafficking um, environment. It can also be within a person's family where their own family traffics them for sex for a number of reasons, no, not excuses. I want to be clear about that. For whatever reason they're doing it, it's not unheard of. And unfortunately, it's not even all that uncommon. And even in those situations where somebody is trafficked, they still blame themselves, especially when the people trafficking them is a parent or somebody that they trust. Because especially as a child, and even as an adult, it can be hard to wrap your head around it. Like, how could a parent do that? And what we come up with as survivors is, I'm unlovable. I'm bad. Because how else could my mom or my dad choose to do this? Why they would do this? It has to be something wrong with me. And of course, it never is. And another piece that I personally, as a therapist, have heard stories of, and it, it and it's kind of crazy to me to think that me as one person has heard a handful of these types of stories is ritualistic abuse and whether it is tied to religion or some sort of pattern that is set up, some sort of um, ritualistic type of experience. So it doesn't have to be tied to religion, but from my experience and then other stories that I have heard about, it's actually an incredibly common thing. And Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> My mind just kind of was going to take me off for a second because I have a lot 
of thoughts about that. But that is a huge thing. And one of the most, well, there's so much that is damaging about that, but one of the things that is incredibly, so incredibly difficult to heal in that is when it is tied to religion is that there are things done and said in the name of God or even the devil or whatever phrases, terms you want to use, people have used. And that, when I talk about like the layers of impact, those layers are many and incredibly profound. So there are a lot of different ways that people can have multiple perpetrators. And what I want survivors to understand about this is that no matter the circumstance, no matter how many, one perpetrator, too many to count, never under any circumstance, no matter what you are trying to make yourself believe, whatever you have needed to believe to survive, not one time, was it ever about you? Not once. Not one perpetrator, not one particular experience. Whether it was somebody you know, whether it was a stranger, a combination of both. Never has it been about you. And if you are somebody who is an ally, a supporter, a somebody who has experienced sexual trauma, again, first, I want to thank you for watching, for being willing to listen to these really difficult conversations. And what I want people who are not survivors to understand, and sometimes even other survivors to understand if there isn't an awareness or understanding of it, is that it isn't the survivor's fault under any circumstance, no matter what, and that it is actually something that is quite common. Because when we look at it as isolated incidents, it is easier to lay fault with the survivor. And it's natural for people to want to do that anyway, not on a conscious level or they wanting to necessarily, but it's part of our self-protective mechanism. So there really is a lot that is tied into the impact that it has and what it takes to be able to heal it. Because again, the more layers they are in everything related to child and sexual trauma has a lot of layers. There are so many layers to the impact, which then means there are so many layers to the healing. Being able to recognize just the immense amount of layers that are there in terms of the impact, which means the immense amount of layers that it takes to be able to heal is so important to understand so that you recognize that this is a process. Undoing the hurt, the betrayal, and that shame. All the such hateful things that you have said to yourself as you've taken on responsibility for the things that have happened to you. Undoing all of that, it's a lot of layers, but that's what healing is. It's moving through each of those layers to connect to the truth of who you are. Not the person that you have believed you are. What the shame has taught you, what the trauma has taught you, what you have told yourself time and time again about who you believe you are, all the hateful 
shameful things that you have said to yourself that have never been based in truth. It's not your fault. You are worthy. You deserved to be protected. And not for one moment have you ever deserved any of those experiences. I'd love to hear from you. Share in the comments whatever you notice being present for you. Healing is possible. It is possible for you to release that shame. It takes time. It takes practice. But you can release that shame. I do not any longer feel any shame about those experiences. Any particular experience individually, nor the fact that I had multiple perpetrators. And I am fully aware that there are people out there who would blame me, who would find a way to make it my fault. I get that. And that's really sad in a lot of ways and says a lot about the lack of understanding and the work that we have to do to continue to raise awareness. But I can be okay with people judging me, blaming me. It may not feel good, <laughs> but I can be okay because I know that it wasn't my fault because I no longer have shame about it. And you deserve that freedom too. Thanks so much for being here. I look forward to seeing you next time.